Today we're going to talk about a, a very general class of models uh, called random growth models. Now I asked what level to pitch this talk and was told that it, there would be a, a wide variety of uh, attendees. So uh, this is uh, at some intermediate level, I'll, I'll say that in advance. And, uh, but if uh, people have technical questions, please ask them because with the whiteboard here, I can go to the whiteboard and elaborate, I think. So, okay. so uh, uh, and I only have about 20 or 20 slides, so I think the idea is that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested in having your questions, all right? So the idea is uh, we look at quite disparate phenomena like uh, cities and firms and, and techs and we'll ask, uh, what they have in common, and, and the pioneer in this was the, was the uh, either famous or infamous Professor Ziff, depending on, uh, on, uh, on how you view him, and we'll, we'll, we'll see as we go through. Uh, there's uh, both pro and con for the great Professor Ziff. Okay, and just to maybe to connect to our, the terminology for College of Science is Science Friday, let me just mention that um, a couple of weeks back, uh, this, this paper appeared in Science, and then the actual NPR Science Friday did a story about it, and so the work that I'm going to discuss is actually mentioned in, in this, in, it was on Science Friday a couple weeks ago with this background. Okay, so some of you will know the following uh, very general uh, uh, idea, that if we take a random sample of, of English text, of any uh, well-specified language text, Russian text, Turkish text, whatever it is, and we plot uh, what is the uh, frequency with which the most common word appears, the second most common, the tenth most common, the hundredth most common, et cetera, you will get this gross regularity uh, of this type. Now, it's plotted here in peculiar coordinates. So for those of you who have not seen the coordinates before, let me just mention that if, in fact, we were to plot uh, frequency, raw frequency of the words, this is you know, how many times does the word the appear? And it may be, you know, in some, in some large text, it may be, you know, uh, 5,000 times. How many times does a, is a less common but to still, still somewhat common word appear like maybe um, uh, and? And it's going to appear with some other frequency. So there's some frequency here. And the, and the question is, what is the rank? Now, if we were to plot it as, as raw frequency rank, it would be very severe. It would be, it'd be it's a plot like this because these words are so much more common than, than, than other words like, you know, uh, chair or desk or, or, or building. So we take the logs. And you get this gross re regularity. And it was this guy, Ziff, who popularized this. He was a linguist. And he, was the, he, he, uh, he, he, he demonstrated that th this was common uh, in, in across uh, um, different languages. And uh, after demonstrating that it was common, he, he attempted to analyze it. Why is it common? Why, why does this happen? Okay. Not only do we get this straight line in these logarithmic coordinates. So notice we're pl plotting now, in that case, log frequency versus log rank. But in fact, the slope is very close to minus 1. I'll sometimes, by the way, call this thing 1. I'll call it minus 1. I, I mean, always mean the same thing. And to see that, if you just want to, you know, with, in these log log plots, it's actually very easy to assess this. How many decades are plotted here? So that would be one decade, two decades, or two, two orders of magnitude, we'll, we'll call right? So there's roughly five orders of magnitude there, and there are five orders of magnitude here. So the slope is roughly 1, minus 1. OK, everybody OK with that? No, so, no, some of you have seen this before. I'm, I'm going to slow for some of you. But if you have not seen it before, that's, uh, that this is, uh, this is a, a well-known result. Now, it turns out that uh, this was actually quite tedious work to do back in the 1930s when, when the good Ziff was uh, working on these things in the 20s and 30s and 40s. He had, he had to log these, data, these frequencies by hand. He had to page through text, new by hand. Of course, today it turns out Google has, uh, has you know, uh, uh, digitized, in essence, you know, the, all books of the you know, Western corpus, as, as it were, for the last two or 300 years. So we know, we know this now out to you know, words that have a very, very low rank. And so there are some deviations. Th things can get kind of weird when you get out to very strange words. And of course, when you have the Google data, and I'm not going to say much more about that, so that you can actually, actually track things like, you know, when do new words appear, like you know, the word uh, uh, diskette did not appear until the you know, 60s or 70s or something. You can track when new words appear. How do they migrate their way up into the distribution? How do they displace other words? I won't say much more about that. I am, what I'm going to talk today about is the why, why do we get this power law, first thing. Power law meaning that in log-log coordinates, we get a straight line. And then in particular, why do we get slope minus 1? And I'm going to basically assert that it's a mystery that has not been solved. Now, you, you may have, you may have uh, some pet ideas about, you've heard about why it should be, my, should be a power law, why it should be a minus one. I'm basically going to argue today that all the things you, you believe you know are wrong, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through those things, okay? Now, it's, uh, there is, in fact, an argument for why it should be that way. This, this argument was made by the well-known uh, scientist Mandelbrot, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, he, Mandelbrot was known for other things. He popularized the idea of fract fractal geometry, fractional dimensional geometry. And here's his very basic idea that communication, 
whether language or speech or whatever, contains information that uh, when we want to write these things down, it's costly to write. That is, if we want to write, you know, uh, uh, you know, the brown cow jumps over the moon, we can write that in, in a few words, or we could maybe have some much more elaborate thing to, way to write that. We want to have some fairly, uh, fairly uh, efficient way to write that. And so Mandelbrot uh, proposed a theory for why, 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 the, why words are the way they are, why word frequencies are, and he says basically that language maximizes information <coughs> divided by cost. So basically language maximizes the efficiency, or you could say it the reverse way, because the language minimizes the cost per unit of information. Now this was a theory that he, espou you know, that he proposed, he derived it, it's, it's a mathematical basis for it, and I'm, I'm just going to describe it now. I propose it, uh, I just mentioned it just as, as something which uh, is in fact uh, an explanation out there. I think we're going to look at other explanations as we go through the day today, uh, but uh, just, just uh, keep this in your head as we, as we, go, as we go forward. Okay, now it turns out that George Miller was a researcher working in this area in the 1950s and 60s, and Miller was not very impressed with Ziff, because Miller said that uh, if in fact you had a keyboard with n letters in one space key, and you just let monkeys type that on that keyboard, they would produce something like Ziff's law. Now, that's not exactly Ziff's law. It's not exactly the pattern we, we saw before, which is a power law with slope minus one, but it's very close to that. There's, there's still some debate about what it actually really is, but uh, it turns out when you let the monkeys type, uh, what they really do is they create you know, all words of length one, all words of length two, all words of length three. So what you really get is a distribution of words of different lengths. And so uh, what, you, what you essentially see is you know, a word of length uh, 20 is just less common than a word of length uh, 19, and, which is less common than a word of length 18, et cetera. So it's, it's, this is more like a, a pattern over the distribution of word lengths. But the main thing to say is that um, you can get these very skewed distributions coming out of kind of very random processes, very stochastic processes, which we think about language. You know, the previous uh, uh, claim of Mandelbrot was that language is efficient and has information content, et cetera. Now, this is kind of the reverse. This is just, you know, just, uh, just whacking uh, keys at random gives you something that looks like this law. Okay. Now it turns out, and now I'm going to talk about my own work, it turns out that in a wide variety of other areas, uh, uh, it is known that we get not only these same kinds of shapes, uh, this is a, a log, log plot of what are the frequency of American business firms. So this is the same kind of thing as before. It's a little bit different axes, but it has the same, uh, technically the same pr probability distribution. Now th this was work that was, was originally done by Ro Robert Gibrat in France in the 1930s. Uh, and, but this, what I'm showing you right here now, is my own work that was published in Science of several years back, which, is, uh, which, are, which are data on how many firms are there of what size. In the U.S., there's one firm with a million employees. Anybody know what firm that is? Walmart. Walmart. There are, it says, uh, th this was data from, from uh, say, t 50, uh, 10 years ago. So today, Walmart has about 1.4 million employees. There are roughly 1 million firms that have one employee, which is the mode. And there's this beautifully smooth distribution down here. And now it turns out this, because this is uh, plotted in, in what's called the probability, uh, the, the PDF format, the slope now is 2. We're, we're going to lose, you know, that's 12 orders of magnitude there, 6 orders of magnitude here. That's slope minus 2. But the CDF would have slope minus 1 if we had plotted it in, this, in, the, in the ZIF way that I showed earlier. So the, the claim is that this is the same exact distribution as language text. And that's very strange. Why would that be the case? But this is not, it's not, these kinds of data are not unique just to firms. Uh, this would be a classic case, a classic plot now of cities, where now we're plotting it in the, in the Ziffian way of plotting at the rank of, uh, versus population size. This is now for the U.S. Uh, New York City is the biggest city. It's the, the first has rank one, so log of one is zero. And these are, you know, Chicago, L.A., et cetera. I think, I'm not sure what, what year this is from. It would be L.A., Chicago if it's done today. And, of course, if it was the top, uh, uh, these, so these are the top ten cities, and et cetera, et cetera, going all the way down to it. The slope of this looks like what? Minus one again, right? So you see uh, roughly, uh, you know, uh, six orders of magnitude here, six orders of magnitude there. Say the it again. Largest right. So it turns out that the, the, main, the main difference that, that's the way I had done the word one initially too. The, the only difference between these two plots. So this is a plot of the probability density function, and this is a plot of the rank. So it turns out the rank is is related by uh, this is this is basically the CDF versus the PDF. Uh, but where it is, if you want to actually get the CDF, you have to you, you flip this over like this because you say I want to have the biggest thing this over here. Uh, but so this is the, kind of the, the, the counter cumulative uh, distribution. Uh, to the, the wide variety of ways to plot them, because the slope is literally minus one, we're going to get the same uh, shape no matter how you know, a whole variety of different ways to plot them. Why is this the case? Why do we have these uh, have these gross re regularities? Uh, 
I claim that's 100 years of mystery because these, these things were first plotted actually before ZIF, it turns out. Uh, today, where these are called the, either ZIF's law or ZIF distribution. Uh, but it turns out they were first plotted in the 19, in the 19 teens by a, a German researcher named Auerbach. And Auerbach uh, 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 did this, uh, should be called the Auerbach's law or something. Um, some of you may, may have heard of Stigler's law. Stigler's law is that the uh, uh, things are in science are named after not the first person to articulate them, but the second person. Uh, and so this is a case of where Ziff is the kind of the second person. By the way, th uh, that, that's known as Stigler's law. I'm told that Stigler was the second person to articulate that, uh, th that theory. Okay, so we're gonna now kind of dig into why is it the case. Now these are gross features of these quite disparate processes, language, cities, firms, why are they the same? When I basically argue that there is in fact a common way to understand them, but there have been also 100 years of, of, of wrong answers, or wrong explanations. So here's, but here's the basic idea, and here's the basic idea we wanna build from, and uh, so let's, let's look at a, a little bit of math. Okay, we're not gonna do a lot of math today, we're gonna just do a little bit of math. So the way to think about, about a city or a firm and how it changes over time is I think it's, uh, it has some, some time today. Sorry, it has, has some size today. And it's going to grow by, it's either going to grow or shrink. It's going to have some size in the, next, in the next period, okay? This is called multiplicative random growth because we're multiplying uh, by the size, all right? Now, this is a very, very simple expression. And uh, it's, it's a scalar function. Uh, it's, uh, if, this, if G were fixed, it would just be some kind of, you know, uh, or we could just iterate that thing and uh, find out what the answer is, if it you know, would uh, potentially you know, grow to infinity or, or decline to zero or something. But we're going to think, treat G as being, or being a random variable. G is stochastic. That's where we get the random part of it, okay? Random growth. Now, we're going to march through just a little bit of derivation, but it should be straightforward, I think. We can also write this thing just for the previous period. The previous period just says, well, whatever, whatever size it was in the previous period, it grew by a little bit. Now it's at that size currently. And so uh, we can write this process over and over and over again. And we basically say, well, it started out at some size at time zero, and I got a bunch of draws from some growth rate distribution, and now it's that size, OK? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's all there is to this, really. And so it's grown multiplicatively. Everybody clear on that? Now, since if we take logs of this, let, let's define x, which is different from y. x is log of y. So we take the log of this whole thing, we just get this kind of thing. If we just remember, in logs, we're going to add things instead of multiply. Multiply becomes add in logs. And so now this should start looking familiar a little bit. So we're going to say now the difference between uh, these logs of where, it, you know, between these two times, and actually this should be time zero, I think. Uh, yeah, we're going to sub subtract this one. This one, this should be, this is a typo here, it should be x at time zero, is the sum of all these logs which let's define log of capital G, the growth rate as being just G. Now this just says that this difference in sizes is this kind of thing, and we're gonna let the time go for some long period of time. And for those of you who have done a little bit of statistics, uh, you may remember the central limit theorem, which says that uh, kind of independent of what G is, as long as G doesn't have weird properties, we're gonna get a distribution of, of, the, of, the, of the left hand side that looks like a normal distribution. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's what this math teaches us. So we can, in, in logs, we can, we can derive, we can get basically that no matter what this thing is here, which may, we, don't want, we don't know what it is necessarily, it's probably different from, from firms and cities and languages, we're going to get something that looks Gaussian. Now, this, this result was, was first uh, uh, written down by an astronomer. So Capitan was a Dutch astronomer, I think a well-known astronomer, and around the turn of the, into the 20th century, he, he wrote this down. Basically, he said he knew the central limit theorem. He knew the, the last equation that I just put up there. And so basically, he said, if the distribution of G is not too weird, then what, we're gonna, what you're going to get is, and you're going to basically draw these Gs independently. So I'm going to just you know, pick a G at random. A firm grows this time. It, it, it grows again. If it shrinks this time, or a city grows and shrinks, it's gonna just, uh, you're going to get both kinds of, uh, of, of activity. So then this x variable, which was the, which was the log of the size, is going to be Gaussian. That's going to be normal. All right, and, uh, but the main thing was that the y variable, the thing we cared about initially, the size, the original size, this is going to be log normal. Okay, now log normal is just going to be something which is skew. It's not quite a power law, but a log normal looks like this. So it's going to have this kind of sh shape with a big fat tail on it here. So this would be, the, you know, say, the size of a city or a firm and the frequency. It would have, have that rough, uh, rough shape. Now, this was uh, known by Capitan, and, and uh, it's a well-known paper where he, where he publishes this. And so it turns out that uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, the French uh, economist who first looked at firm sizes, Gibrat knew this. Gibrat knew that result of Capitan. 
And so he basically walked around and he asked French firms, he said, how, how many people are employed at your, at your company? And he just walked around Paris in the 1920s, writing a PhD dissertation, and he, and he got a whole bunch of data. And what he showed was, in fact, the distribution of firm sizes in France in 1928, 29 was log normal. And he dubbed this the law of proportional effect. That you say that the size you are at, time, at the next time period is proportional to how big you are now. Okay? It's a more natural way to think about it. It's a very simple, simple relationship. It's stochastic, it's random. But it's just, you know, the next period, next period size is proportional to where you are today. And so that's for a long time, we, we, we still call this the law of proportional effect, okay? It's a natural way to think about it. And it gives the right answer, apparently. Remember, Jabra got the data, it was log normal. What about catastrophes? Like macroeconomic shocks, like World War II or something. Yeah. Right. So, of course, he, he got the data when, when it was when, uh, outside of such a catastrophe. So I think we don't know a lot about that. Although, I'll say, let me just, I probably won't have time to mention it at the end. So I'll, let me say, in the context of city sizes, something very peculiar happened uh, a couple of years back. Um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I'll get the numbers a little bit wrong. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were roughly the Japanese, uh, say, like, eighth or ninth biggest city and tenth or eleventh or twelfth biggest city. Of course, they suffered dramatic catastrophe. Somewhere around 2010, 2010, they re recovered the original and, position. And, and the effect of the Depression? Yeah, so of course, now, uh, back in the Depression, we didn't have systematic data gathering, so we don't know what, what the structure of the firms was then. We know cities, but we don't know firms. We have another data point now, 2008. That's right. So I'll, actually, I'll show some, I may have time to show some data about 2008, because we, we have, the, we have the, the data, at least for firms on that. Okay, but uh, so th th this seems like it's all straightforward. I mean, it's, uh, we're, we're, now we're getting out uh, log normals, not power laws. But it turns out that there's one slight issue, is that um, this is all changing with time. And so it turns out that when we really think about the, uh, the equations I wrote down previously, what we're going to get is that this log normal is not stationary. That it is not going to be a fixed distribution for all time, but rather, I'm going to get a different, kind of a different color here. We're going to basically see that uh, the average will stay the same, but over time what you would expect is, you would expect the big firms to get bigger, and more of them, and the small firms to get small firms to get smaller, and so uh, I, I probably should have drawn it this way. Should have drawn it like something like this, where the, there's more more mass out in the tail here, and there's more mass in. This. And so that is not observed empirically. So there's a problem with this basic explanation, even though this is the law of proportional effect still looks right. It's not going to give the right answer. It's not going to give us a power law, and so this is a, this is a problem. So it turns out that uh, Ziff, uh, now he's trying to figure out. You know, he's a linguist, but he's, he has the data on cities and other things, and he's trying to figure out you know, what's going on with these data. He, turns out he, actually, he, he himself is not a mathematical theorist. He's not somebody who's going to be able to contribute really to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to this quantitative discussion. But he does make the following observation, which is very amazing, in 1930. He says, uh, he, so he moves from words to cities, gets the data, and he, he notes that, and he writes a book called National Unity and Disunity. And he notes that Germany plus Austria fits the ZIF distribution much better than, than either one alone. So uh, you, you guys know what, the, what, what happened to Germany and Austria in the 19, late, late 1930s, right? Anschluss. And so this is a curious, uh, I mentioned just by way of background, he's, ZIF was a curious character, and uh, I can go into more detail about him. I should also mention that Gibrat, go back, go back, Gibrat was a curious character. So during the, um, he, was a, he was an en engineer, economist, and then during, the, uh, during World War II, he actually was a collaborator with the Vichy government. And so once, so after World War II, he, he was uh, jailed for a brief period uh, for, for what he had done uh, in World War II. Anyways, okay, so we have this funny thing about Ziff. But now we're going to get in the 1950s, we're going to get actually some theory about why things are the way they, why, why things are going, why things look the way they do. And so what Mandelbrot does is, he writes down the official, this, this, the theory that I mentioned earlier, the thing about language is efficient. Language should provide a dense representation of, of ideas. And so you can, def, you can get out that, um, that, that you should get something like a power law. At the same time, he comes across a funny, very curious thing. He shows that uh, cotton prices on financial markets are also a power law. And he's not, not sure what to make of that. It turns out he, uh, he would spend much of his later career uh, arguing that um, if you uh, uh, much of the uh, theory of, of how we do investments is based on having Gaussian fluctuations, not uh, these heavy-tailed power law fluctuations, and, and uh, Mandelbrot would uh, 
you know, he, for example, he would, he would oftentimes start his talks uh, in his, at the end of his career saying things like, um, I can prove that I'm two billion years old because uh, in my lifetime there have been two uh, 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 20 sigma fluctuations of the New York Stock Exchange, and if everything was Gaussian, those would only happen uh, once every billion years. So uh, he would, uh, uh, he, he, was a, he was a great proselytizer of the general class of ideas that we're talking about here today, power laws and heavy tails. Okay, it was really left to Herbert Simon to write down the first theory which gives us the, the right answer, which is the power law. And so Simon says, power laws happen when we get birth events. That is, we get new words forming new firms and new cities. And so when, when we can get new things happening and they start out very small and they're gonna grow, that's what we can get, that's what we can get, get we can break this log normal and we can get the, get the right power law coming out. What, basically what the small things does, it, is having this, the birth process, it cuts out all the stuff at the low end here and gives you the, gives you the right answer at the power law. Now the trouble with this thing is that, um, well the good news about it is that as long as this birth rate is small, the slope will be very close to one, minus one, so it turns out as long as you get, think about the, as long as you know, the number of cities forming, the number of new cities is small, you should expect to see a distribution of city sizes that looks a lot like what, what we see in reality. You know, think about, you know, Phoenix is a new city. Phoenix was very tiny in the 19th century. Uh, Phoenix comes along, it grows, and, and so this is one rationale. Now the trouble is this theory doesn't work very well for firms. Now in, for American firms, uh, there's about six million firms that have, have employees. Uh, anybody know what the rate of firm formation is, you know, ballpark? So there's just, just short of 100,000 firms forming per month. Something is, let's say, to be for, for, you know, for purpose of discussion, let's say it's 50,000. Well, 50,000 firms forming per month times 12 can give you 600,000 firms per year. That's 10% of the entire U.S. Uh, firm population every year forms. So we have actually very high rates of firm formation. And this would, that would produce an exponent that's not very close to one. Okay, so this is an okay explanation for cities, but it's probably not right for firms. So let's, let's press forward here. And I want to, uh, basically we have two questions to answer now. We, the two questions are, are going to be, are, are still on the table are, why do we get these power laws in cities and firms and word frequencies? Why do we get a slope minus one? Now those are two separate questions. We could have any kind of power law. I've written here slope minus one. We could have a steeper power law with a bigger slope minus two, say, or a more shallow power law, slope minus one half. Why are we getting slope minus one? Why are we getting a power law? So here's the way I want you guys to think about this, and here's, here's the intuition uh, for, for the, the new theory that I'm just gonna describe here qualitatively, is that uh, this is now, uh, take, think about a one-dimensional random walk of a particle between two barriers. Okay, a very simple uh, idea. So this particle, let's say it moves left to right with equal probability, Okay, and it can't go left of that barrier, it can't go right of that barrier. So I'm now thinking, no, no notion to think about cities. You know, cities can get, can, you know, imagine a city can't get too small or a firm can't get too small, a firm can't go below one employee. Maybe there's no upper limit. Maybe there's no firm is bigger than Walmart. Walmart has a million employees. So maybe this is a limit from, you know, a firm has to be between one employee and a million. Let's, let's just say that. Now if I, ask, if I imagine that this thing is, this, part, this particle is bouncing around, going back and forth. What's going to be the distribution of locations of this thing and say in the x, x axis. So if I were to say, what is the frequency of positions of that particle when it's just bouncing around over the, between those two barriers? And hopefully the intuition is, is clear to everybody. If it's just bouncing around and it can't go left of that, it can't go right of that, it, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be a uniform distribution in, that, in, that, in between those two things, okay? Now, what I want you to think about next is, what if we start walking this barrier to the right. I'm going to carry it down here. I'm going to keep going a long ways, all right? That means we're going to have an, only one barrier. You can imagine that I'm going to have, to, I'm going to have this uniform distribution is going to, going to keep going now all the way down, but now the probability mass has got to be one, so you know, the amount of time it spends here or here or here is going to be less than it was before. So I'm going to get, you know, as, I, as the barrier moves to the right, I'm going to get, get a, you know, a lower distribution and a lower one until pretty soon if I just let it walk anywhere it wants to, it's going to have vanishing probability of being anywhere. So what I want to do is I want to every once in a while kick this particle to the left, okay? I'm going to drive this, think about a firm. Firms can, firms can be any size above, say, one, but occasionally they have to be, they, 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 but, but the tendency is for them to lose employees, say. Okay, so this is called now a process with drift, where the, where the particle is drifting down. 
All right. Now, if it's, got, if it's got a little bit of drift or a lot of bit of drift or a lot of drift, it's going to matter wh for where it is. But it turns out that instead of having a uniform distribution, what I'm going to end up with now is I'm going to end up with a, an exponential distribution. So the frequency with one barrier over x is going to be a, an exponential distribution as long as I'm driving it to the left, to the barrier. Okay? If I'm driving it left, it's just not going to be very common for it to go out to infinity. Everybody got that? So this it should be quite specific. This is, now, this is a random walk with one barrier. All right, now this is a random walk in the x space. And it turns out that we, we, x was, our, was log of our size, not, not the actual size. So it turns out that we can think about this as if x is exponential, which I've just shown you that it, that it needs to be. And by the way, I should say those results were first, it was proved that that, that, uh, that random walk produced an exponential. That was first proven in the 1950s in the context of queuing theory, for, of all things. Uh, if x is exponential, y is a power law. And, wh and what this is just says, if x is exponential, so x is going uh, like exponential, and then y, remember y was, uh, uh, y was, it was exp of x, or x was log of y, same. So if, if this thing's going to be exponential, then y is going to be the Pareto distribution, or uh, power law. Power law, OK? So this is why the power law happens. That is, as long as any kind of process that's going to have a, any kind of random walk process that's going to be drifting back toward the origin, but it's drifting back in the, in the log of sizes, is going to be, be power law. So we got, that's, the first, that's the answer to our first question. Why the second question? Why slope minus 1? Now it turns out that if we, we can look at other distributions in, in, in economics and uh, finance and in natural sciences, it doesn't matter. And we can see plots that are not slope minus one. For example, this is data from the IRS on adjusted gross incomes in America. And what it says is we have an, this is now in log coordinates, what, what fra cumulative fraction of people have what income, 10K, 100K, million dollars. What you see is that there's an exponential distribution of, of incomes below about 100K. There is a power law distribution of incomes above 100K. But you know, this power law does not have slope minus 1. It has slope about minus 1.5. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's more shallow than it has a steeper slope than, uh, than, than, than minus 1. There are, you know, there basically, there are not enough billionaires in the, in the world uh, if, 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 versus the Ziff law. Okay? So we don't always get mi minus 1 as a slope. So why do we get minus 1? And so here is the conventional explanation due to an economist from about 10 years ago. He says, as long as there exists an average, as long as there's an average firm size, average city size, as long as an average exists, and the average is much bigger than the minimum size, then the slope is going to be minus one. The slope is going to approach one. OK, so let me just, uh, here's a quick background on this. Remember, this was the original distribution. In log coordinates, it gives us a power law. Log frequency, log rank, say. Now these power laws, though, are so skew that, in, that depending on what the exponent is, you may or may not get these, for example, the average to exist. Uh, so think about this. We th normally think about, you know, with a Gaussian distribution, there's going to be some typical mean value and there's some variability ar around the mean, some typical variability. Well, these things are so skewed. There's so much weight out in, you know, because we have one Walmart with a million employees and we have a million small firms with one employee, it turns out that variance does not exist for, the, for that distribution. So for cities, for firm size, if you ask the question, what is, um, what is the average American city? There's, a, there's an answer. What is the typical variability of the American city? The answer is it's not defined. It's not well defined. If you, can, if, you, if you try to compute the variance, of course, if I were to compute the variance for some finite sample, I'll always get a number. But the issue is that if I compute the variance, say I compute the variance for the US city sizes and I get some number, in general, as I, as I, as I add more and more cities to, to the thing, it's, it's going to be basically, it's going to be some, some di diverging thing. So it's going to end up with some number, but the, but the variance is diverging. Now it turns out when slope is 1, uh, the mean also is borderline meaningful. Uh, so any, anybody, we talked about firms and uh, firms that have slope very close to 1. Uh, anybody know what is the, if I ask you, what is the typical American firm? What's the answer? What do, what do you think? If you, or if you, imagine asking your congressman, what is the typical firm size in his district, his or her district? What does the person say? If I think of some, you know, some 
fairly large manufacturing something or other, and maybe 500 people, maybe 1,000 employees. Well, we said there are 6 million firms that have employees in America. There are 120 million workers in the private sector. That means that the average firm size in America is 20, average. The mode is one, as I showed. Most common is one. The median is three. So half of the firms in America have size bigger than three, half are smaller than three. Now this is a very peculiar di distribution. Mode one, median three, average 20. And your congressman says si size 500 or 1,000. I mean, a, the congressman obviously did, doesn't know what, the, what, what it means to be typical. The main thing to say is that it's not obvious how to, how to characterize the, the distribution. So it turns out that in general, we may, we may not want to believe that the average exists. And so uh, this theory, which has been around for 10 years, works but is problematical. I'm going, to now just, I'm going to give you now a one slide version of what I think is a better theory of why cities are the, the size that they are, why firms are the way they are, and even why words have the distribution that they, that they do. And here's the, here's the yeah, what, what if the average doesn't exist I wrote here. So here's the idea. Imagine that we have a city of size M and another city of size K. And this is time T. And now, in the next period, one person has migrated between these cities. Now, there's some chance it could be that the bigger city got the person and the other city lost the person. Could have happened. Or it could have happened that the bigger city, it's too crowded in that big city, somebody left the big city, they went to live in Iowa. Okay? Could be that. This is just really a balance condition. This is just saying, I think in physics you would call it detailed balance. I'm not a physicist. I'm prepared to believe I'm wrong about that. Uh, you would just you'd be saying there's so many bodies here, there's so many bodies here, the same number of bodies here, two ways to rearrange it. Okay? Everybody got that basic idea? Let's, let's think it's a firm. A firm with M employees, a firm with K employees. Somebody changes jobs. One person changes jobs. They could go and make the big firm bigger. They could make the, make the little firm bigger. Okay? There's two possibilities. Now, the, the, the new result we have, and it's a theorem that we can prove, is that uh, when one condition is met, so this happens with probability P, that happens with probability Q. If P is bigger than Q, you're going to get a power law. It's going to be slope minus 1. You have people being born, though. People being born. That's right. So that's, now that's back to Simon, the new bodies. Let, let's take the very, a very short run circumstance and imagine anyway, and say it's just a, how are, what is, what's going to be the distribution of workers by firms in the next year? Uh, the number of workers is more or less constant. So you're uh, there's no workers available? We, we can. There's no unemployment pool to go into these Right. Well, we're, we're assuming maybe it's a constant unemployment pool. Right. Kind of. So it turns out we can, we, can, we can modify the theory. I've, I kind of skipped over that just for purpose of uh, exposition. We can modify the theory by having, as long as the, the birth rate is relatively small, this is all going all to go through. But so the basic result, though, is that if, in fact, if this is more likely, if this is more common, that is, the big things get smaller. You're not going to get a power law with a slope minus 1. You're going to get an exponential distribution. You're going to get the wrong answer. But as long as this is true, we get the right answer. Okay? So let, let, let's, see, let, let's, let's think about what, what does it mean for firms. For firms, it just says, you know, there's a reason why this firm is big. They pay better, better benefits, something or other, right? Uh, anybody in the room is an economist, maybe? So there's something called the uh, uh, wage size effect in, in the theory of the firm. Brown and Medoff, 1992 or three or four. That basically says that as a firm gets bigger, it pays more. So control for job types. So take a you know, welder type three aluminum or something, right, in, in, in Milwaukee. A whole bunch of welders doing that stuff. If you, as you go to a bigger and bigger and bigger firm, you get about 10% more pay as the firm gets 10 times bigger. So for every decade of firm size, you go up. So they say, imagine some, or maybe a better example that I know better, Detroit. In Detroit, there's eight, along Eight Mile Road, there are tool and die shops of all different sizes, from size 10 to 100 to 1,000, OK? And as you go from a, to a bigger and bigger plant, you get paid about 10% more. That's empirical gross regularity of the US economy. So it may be, in fact, that it's just, it's just more likely that somebody's going to leave the job that they're going to go here. Not here. Now, maybe they go here because, because you know, this, this could happen. People, want, people have more autonomy in the small firm. They're going to want, they want to be their own boss, whatever. So we're not saying it's not possible that if, 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 if Q is zero, we just get one giant Soviet firm, which is not credible, right? So with some probability P, 
the kind of the, 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 the job changer goes to the bigger firm with some uh, smaller probability Q it goes to the smaller firm. This is going to give you Ziff's law, slope minus one. Okay, cities, what does it mean for cities? You know, there are more opportunities in the bigger city. You know, you, you, it's, it's, it's just more common to see people moving from Iowa to uh, Chicago, not from Chicago to Iowa. I mean, that's a practical matter. That's, you know, that's, you can interpret it in different ways. A little, bit more, a little bit tricky though, what does it mean for words? Now, in the case of words, uh, we're not talking about kind of like the ebb and flow of, of, you know, the word the is cited a certain number of times as, with a certain frequency in, 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 in English language text. We're not imagining that that ebbs and flows somehow. But what we're really thinking about is how much does, when a new book gets written, how does the additional contribution of the word the and 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 all the other words to the global frequency di dis distribution change? And I think one thing that falls out of this is that, um, is that uh, when you think about the, uh, the naive models, which I just showed earlier, the models that don't have this kind of uh, uh, detailed balance condition going on. Now, the, the trouble with those models for uh, thinking about word usage is that um, uh, you know, it, it is the case that you know, the word the can't just be written down a, a bunch of times in a row and have a meaningful sentence. It has to be written with other words. So there has to be some, uh, you know, so words come in, come in uh, fra word phrases. In fact, some of you will know the Google data about uh, the Google Books data, what Google Books does, which is very cool, is they actually say not just what is the frequency of, of individual words, what's the frequency of individual word pairs, of triples, of, of quadruples, et cetera. So they give you the whole distribution of all those words, and it's very, in, in, very uh, uh, interesting to, to see all those different uh, word couple, couples, as it were. So we can actually compute in that case, we can compute you know, what, what, is the, what is the correlation between words of certain types. And so it turns out that this, this, this model broadly applies to language, though I'd say it has some, a couple caveats that I'm not going to go into here and now. Anyway, so the bottom line, and I'll stop here, maybe take some questions, is that, um, is that with this uh, ostensibly quite simple theory, which just says that, um, you know, uh, now think about back to, the, back to Gibrat's law of proportional growth. This is a little bit like proportional growth where it says that, um, you know, but, but with the bigger getting bigger. And the, and the small have a little bit less probability of staying the same size. So it's a little bit like you know, the rich get richer effect. Uh, this is sufficient to explain uh, uh, many of these gross regularities that we have, that we find in our day-to-day -day lives in the social world. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, take some questions. Thank you.